being recorded and there is an ASL interpreter available for anybody with accessibility needs. Please leave a message in the chat if you can't see the interpreter and we'll try to adjust the screen. Hello, this is the National Council for Preservation Education's summer webinar series, the last of four sessions on topics related to the Federal Historic Preservation Program. These informational sessions are designed for anyone new to or interested in the subject, including our NCPE interns. I'm Julie Johnson, the director of NCPE's internship program and the moderator of the webinars. This series is offered by NCPE with the assistance of the National Park Service's Cultural Resources, Partnerships, and Science Directorate. Today, our panelists will discuss the Great American Outdoors Act of 2020. First, I wanna say thank you for joining me today. I'm delighted you can participate. I look forward to your questions and comments, which I invite you to put into the chat at any time. And thank you to our panelists for participating. We really appreciate uh, them sharing our, their expertise. And before I introduce our panelists and my co-host from MPS, I'd like to say a few words about NCPE's internship program and this year's interns. The program was created in 1991, but started the following year, uh, the following summer with six interns, all working in Washington, where they helped the uh, Technical Preservation Services staff research and write preservation briefs. There are currently 100 interns working in 59 different parks, offices, and units of the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and General Services Administration. That doesn't include the 12 interns who completed their internship last month, or the nine interns who are gonna be starting up again, starting up in August. The host sites are in 23 states, in addition to Washington, DC. 30 years after our first summer, NCPE still has a large cadre of interns in the Metro DC area, as this map shows. But they can be found at sites throughout the United States with some offices and parks able to host multiple interns doing a wide variety of work. For example, we have a recent graduate with her master's degree in uh, urban planning and heritage conservation from the University of Southern California, working with cultural resources at the Reconstruction Era uh, National Historical Park in Beaufort, South Carolina. There's a recent graduate in anthropology from the University of Arkansas Fayetteville doing archeological work at Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. A Drake University student in majoring in history and sociology is working on historic preservation partnerships in interior Re region three, four, and five, the Midwest Regional Office in Omaha. And we have a current student in historic preservation um, at the University of Maryland, <clears throat> working as a architectural conservator at National Mall and Memorial Parks in DC. All told, <clears throat> 400 students applied for almost 75 summer internship positions this year, which makes it a competitive award. While being selected depends on the right mix of relevant coursework, um, volunteer experiences, and paid work, it can also be a factor of location. This summer, we advertise a museum internship in DC and another one in Ohio. The one uh, uh, advertised um, for the District of Columbia received 63 applications and the one in the Midwest got seven. It's important to remember that sometimes you can greatly increase your chances of being interviewed and hired for sometimes very similar work if you're willing to travel to places new to you. The fall application round for winter 2023 internships will be advertised on NCPE's Preservation Resources website, PreserveNet, in late September with applications due in late October. To review the eligibility requirements and for instructions on how to apply, visit preservenet.org and look for NCPE internships under employment. Since the internship program began in 1992, 
almost 7,000 college students and recent graduates have been awarded internships by NCPE, some working full-time at summer jobs and others part-time during the academic year. They've been able to learn from and contribute to the work done by knowledgeable professionals. And in many instances, this work experience has led to future employment with the Park Service. I'm joined today by Paloma Belazny, the Youth Programs Coordinator at MPS's Cultural Resources uh, Office of Interpretation and Education in Washington, DC, and a former NCPE intern. Paloma and her office conceived of the topics of this year's webinars, which I think has been especially interesting. And she assembled all our speakers for which I thank her very much. Paloma has a few words to say about accessibility while on Zoom. So I'm wondering Paloma, if you can jump in that right now and say- Yes, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm Paloma Belazny. I'm the Youth Programs Coordinator for the Cultural Resources Directorate. I work at the Washington office. Um, and as Julie said, I work with her to administer the NICP program in addition to um, other internship and fellowship programs. And I wanna thank Julie for doing all the technical work it takes to put on um, this webinar series. It is a big lift. So thank you and thank you to our speakers today for lending their expertise and time um, for, for the webinar. Just a few accessibility tips to keep in mind. Um, so to keep your mic muted unless you're speaking, um, to raise use the raise your hand feature um, instead of speaking unannounced, but we, we only have a few panelists, so that's not necessarily um, as important here as um, for when there are multiple people in a meeting. Um, when speaking, have your video on, introduce yourself when speaking, and to speak slowly, but not too slowly, um, but to keep in mind to, to speak slowly. Um, and these are good tips for us all at any meeting. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Julie. Thank you. I couldn't find my unmute button there for a moment. Uh, thanks Paloma, this is Julie Johnson speaking again. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, jumping in with those great timely reminders. Um, and for all your hard work in putting uh, together this webinar series. Uh, on the subject of webinar topics, I'd like to know if our attendees have a suggestion for future webinars, uh, either for the summer or for more probably the benefit of our interns next summer. Uh, if so, put that in the chat and we will seriously consider it. Uh, your feedback on this is uh, very much appreciated. Um, as I said, our panelists today uh, will address the topic of the Great American Outdoors Act. You may put any questions for them in the chat and we'll respond uh, after each presentation. Uh, we hope there's also time afterwards at the end of the session for Q&A. Um, I will also provide contact emails for all the speakers. Finally, uh, all the sessions uh, will be uploaded with captioning to NCPE's YouTube channel which can be found by searching YouTube by the organization's full name, National Council for Preservation Education. The first three webinars in this series have been uploaded and are ready for viewing. So I wanna go ahead and start with our first speaker, Chris Finley. Uh, Chris began his National Park Service career as an architect in 1993 and subsequently served as a facility manager at Hazateague Island National Seashore and at Grand Teton National Park. He is currently with the National Park Service's major construction division. His team is responsible for program development and execution for the Legacy Restoration Fund and line item construction program. Um, and I wonder, Chris, if you can take over from me now. You bet. Um, so I'll do that. And I will do this. Do you see my screen? I, and I, will, I do. And I'll 
start from the beginning of the presentation. How's that looking? Oh, that's looking great. Great. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm Chris Finley with the National Park Service uh, Major Construction Division, and I'm happy to be here today to talk with you about Great American Outdoors Act Legacy Restoration Fund in federal government speak. That is the GOA LRF. So hopefully I won't slip too much into federal uh, acronyms. So the Great American Outdoors Act was passed in August of 2020. Um, it accomplished two primary objectives. It established the National Parks and Public Land Legacy Restoration Fund, and it also provided permanent and full funding to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We're going to concentrate on the Legacy Restoration Fund, uh, the LRF. This funding uh, is generated by oil and gas uh, revenue from leases uh, on, on those uh, those wells that occur on federal land. So it's a very reliable fund source. It is not direct taxpayer uh, revenue, but it is uh, federal revenue nonetheless. If you look at the bottom kind of third of the screen, you can see the top line of that spreadsheet highlighted in blue. That shows that the National Park Service's share of the LRF is 70%, which equates to 1.33 billion a year for five years, starting in FY21, and totaling 6.65 billion by the end of the program. The primary objective of the Legacy Restoration Fund is to reduce or eliminate deferred, uh, ma deferred maintenance on the built environment on our portfolio assets. Transportation projects are restricted to 35% uh, of the funding. So this is really directed towards non-transportation assets primarily. Um, in terms of how we uh, developed project selection criteria, in addition to uh, addressing deferred maintenance, a project needed to be large, uh, typically $20 million or greater which is at a magnitude that typically exceeds the ability of, of our other facility fund sources to fund. It's just too big for those fund sources. Um, also large projects of that magnitude um, come with kind of operational and execution efficiencies. It is easier to manage fewer large projects than it is to manage a large number of small projects in terms of project management, solicitation, procurement, and construction execution. Um, a, um, another really key element of project selection criteria is what we refer to as readiness and capacity to execute. The project needed to be ready to execute uh, in terms of being fully designed, environmental compliance, cultural uh, resource, you know, cultural consultation, and all other uh, compliance needed to be complete uh, and ready to go. The park unit and the project team also had to have the capacity to execute that large and complex project at their site. Finally, um, as we selected projects, we were looking towards those that incorporated upgrades for accessibility, achieved code compliance, and also uh, you know, paid uh, respect to climate resiliency and environmental sustainability in their proposed solutions. The LRF is, of course, the newest and largest funding source available to the NPS for facility investments. Um, uh, but so if you combine that with all of the other facility uh, investment fund sources that we have, a total of $2.4 billion was available in FY22 for National Park Service facility investments. And again, this has been primarily directed towards deferred, ma deferred maintenance. We're not really building new assets with this funding. Um, looking at the map, this uh, color-coded map really indicates uh, the first three years of Im implementation and where it has occurred. The darker shades of green indicate uh, larger LRF investments over uh, the first three years, FY1 to FY3. Um, and typically that's a function of, you know, states like California, Wyoming, and Virginia uh, have some combination of a large number of National Park Service units in those states, 
and the units they have have large asset portfolios that, that feature a lot of deferred maintenance. So, um, you know, the first three years of the uh, LRF, uh, we have achieved um, programming of 2.9 billion or just under $3 billion in project programming. And about one third of those projects were uh, directed towards historic structures and uh, cultural resource assets. Uh, just to look at a few examples with specific uh, focus on cultural resource assets, we'll start with the Northeast and national capital regions. Looking across the top row of images on this slide uh, at the upper left, uh, we funded a rehabilitation of the historic Belmont Hall House uh, in Washington, D.C. The top center, uh, we funded the uh, Statue of Liberty's Terraplane Rehabilitation. Uh, that's in New York City. And in the upper right, uh, we helped to repair a dam and abutment at the CNO Canal in Maryland. In the Midwest region, uh, in the upper right, uh, the LRF funds are helping to stabilize a river bank along a towpath trail for the Valley Railway at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio. And in the lower center of the screen is uh, a rehabilitation project of the Upper Plaza at Perry's Victory Peace Memorial in Ohio. Finally, at the Pacific West region, uh, the upper left of the screen um, shows a rehabilitation of the historic parade ground and barracks building at Fort Vancouver in Washington. And along the lower center of the screen is an image of the stabilization of the Alcatraz Wharf at Golden Gate National Recreation Area in the San Francisco Bay. Um, you know, another, um, Kind of initiative that the LRF has helped us to spearhead um, is something that we're referring to as the maintenance action teams or the MATS. You know, the first really first two or three years of the program have really been focused on parks that had the largest portfolios and the largest visitation. And the idea was that we would go, the money would be invested where the need was greatest and where the return on investment in terms of the number of people that would be impacted, the number of visitors impacted by that investment would be greatest. Uh, really, um, that was great, but medium and small park units missed out on those opportunities. So the MAT teams are one of the strategies we're going to use to help those medium, medium and small parks get their share of the LRF funding. In addition, uh, medium and small park units typically aren't as successful in developing um, funding proposals that receive uh, funding from the National Park Service. When they do receive those funding proposals, sometimes they struggle to manage or execute that work. And so the MATS are going to help them to achieve those um, objectives. We also hope that it will help small and medium parks to build capacity over time so that they can begin to have these teams access, access um, to them so that they can address uh, backlog maintenance and repairs in their in their parks in the future. Um, another thing that will occur with these MAP programs is these parks will have the collective opportunity to access phil philanthropic partnerships. You know, large, uh, big, you know, um, crown jewel uh, parks in the system typically have their own friends groups who have philanthropic capacity and, and make major donations to achieve. Um, you know, facility improvements at those parks. Medium small parks don't typically have those opportunities. So collectively through the MAP program, we hope help to um, achieve that through national philanthropic partnerships through some of our major donors uh, on a corporate level that work with us nationally. Finally, as we look to the next uh, generation of park stewards and national park employees, these uh, MAP teams are going to give us an opportunity to uh, introduce youth uh, to careers in the National Park Services, as well as uh, underrepresented communities and veterans to opportunities, not only to work at a national park and an internship for a summer, uh, but to consider a long-term career with the National Park Service. Um, some challenges that we've had to LR 
LRF project execution started with a tight timeline when the act was signed in August of 2020. We had 90 days to produce the FY21 project list. Um, that was pretty challenging. Uh, next came uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic, which I think impacted just about every organization uh, in the country, if not the world. Um, this was also a very large um, program to stand up and to deploy. And I talked about that before, this is much larger than our other fund sources. So our ability to um, quickly increase our staff capacity and address um, it, you know, the increased workload with our very limited hiring flexibilities and the tools that we currently have in place to staff up quickly uh, was really tested. Um, what I highlighted on this slide, though, is what's currently, um, I think, our most uh, challenging situation, which is construction market inflation. <clears throat> Supply chain and shipping bottlenecks have uh, really impacted the construction industry and the ability for contractors to acquire construction materials in a timely and predictable manner. And that has impacted their, their bids. So it is becoming increasingly difficult for us to predict ahead of time before we advertise a project, what uh, you know the price of those proposals, and then when those bids come in, trying to justify uh, the costs that we're seeing on the bids compared to what we estimated those costs to be. So that's a challenge we continue to work with um, through our professional cost estimators and our architect and engineering firms going forward. So that provides my very brief overview of the LRF uh, implementation at the National Park Service. I can turn the uh, microphone over to Aaron LaRocca from the George Washington Memorial Parkway now, and he's gonna talk about one of our LRF projects that's occurring uh, at Clara Barton National Historic Site. Yeah, I'd be, uh, I'll uh, introduce you, Aaron, since you gave me that nice bio. And uh, while I'm doing that, go ahead and take over. Um, so Aaron LaRocca is a 16-year veteran of the National Park Service. From 2015 until earlier this year, he was the Chief of Staff of George Washington Memorial Parkway, where he was responsible for external relations, including congressional affairs and partnerships with nonprofit park partners, while also serving as the park's public information officer. Aaron previously worked as site manager at Glen Echo Park and the Clara Barton National Historic Site and was supervisory park ranger for the North District of the George Washington Memorial Parkway. Aaron began his MPS career in 2006 as a student working at Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial, while earning his bachelor's degree in American history from George Mason University in Fairfax. And two months ago, he became the new superintendent of Guilford Courthouse National Memorial Park, excuse me, wow. National Military Park in Greensboro, North Carolina. So Aaron, you look all set to go. Uh, take it away. Can you just confirm? I think I'm sharing my screen, but I think I'm having trouble with kind of the full project uh, PowerPoint presentation mode, is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, we can see your little thumbnails along the uh, left-hand side. Did you right. want to go into the slideshow? Yeah, but the... It's okay if it's not working for you. This Let is me, fine. I'm going to try to share again. One second, please. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's try this. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you for that kind introduction. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working at the uh, options bar for Zoom is blocking the ability to share all. Let me try one other thing. All right, there we go. Thank you for your patience, figured out how to work. I appreciate that introduction just because I recently accepted a new position as superintendent at Guilford doesn't mean I know how to use Zoom. So there's hope for all of us uh, technically challenged folks out there. So a snapshot of the parkway. 
Uh, it's located right outside Washington, D.C., 18-mile roadway uh, within Virginia, a little section within Washington, D.C., and a little section within Maryland called the Clara Barton Parkway. Um, we have 7.2 million annual visitors. That's simply the recreational users that we have in the park. We also have another 34 million users annually on our roadway. Uh, I like to point to our deferred maintenance number, 600 million. Also, uh, the amount estimated that we would have to share on uh, annual routine maintenance uh, to, to address that deferred maintenance number or to stop it from growing would be about a quarter of our uh, appropriated, appropriated annual operational funds known as uh, ONPS. I'm not going to, to read these word for word, but uh, within the parkway, we have a strategic plan. Uh, that strategic plan includes our vision and mission. And that strategic plan stems into something known as our priorities and actions document. Our priorities and actions document takes the strategic plan and puts them into implementable actions. Within that priorities and actions document, there's four emphasis areas. Two that relate to uh, kind of internal and park staff, that your voice matters and a robust workforce. And then two is the way we do our work. Uh, one of those is stewardship. So uh, as part of our stewardship, um, these are highlighted because they relate directly to the project that I'm gonna talk about, the LRF project, the GOA project in our park, uh, Clara Barton National Historic Site. And so all of those highlighted ones are um, kind of actions and focus areas um, that parallel to the work that we're doing at Clara Barton National Storage Site. And the stewardship emphasis area makes a lot of sense. And, and you'll see in a few minutes why the partnership emphasis area also aligns very closely with what we're doing at Clara Barton National Historic Site. I'm not gonna do a deep dive into this because Chris did a really nice job of giving an overarching kind of understanding of uh, Great American Outdoors Act and LRF. Thank you for that, Chris. Allows me to skip ahead. But I do wanna highlight um, on the right side of the screen there, three of those kind of um, filters, if you will that informed how parks could compete well for LRF funding. Chris highlighted these very nicely. Uh, visitation, whether they're ready to start, kind of referred to as shovel ready, and what leveraging opportunities that uh, LRF funding makes available for these projects. And, and we'll talk more about leveraging in a few slides. So when we at the park understood that we'd have this opportunity to um, meet our stewardship responsibilities, we had a number of projects that we considered uh, to put forward to compete for LRF funding. Uh, the, the picture there is of the, the South Parkway, the original section of the parkway, originally dating to the 1930s. Uh, that trail there parallels the Potomac River. Uh, it's known as the Mount Vernon Trail. It has about 1.5 million uh, users annually. 18 mile long paved trail, very popular. Uh, we have uh, the, the kind of middle picture the, that those are um, batteries. They would have been uh, as part of the de defenses of Washington, uh, they would have been batteries for, for cannons overlooking the Potomac River at Fort Hunt Park. Uh, the, the waterfalls you see is Great Falls Park. Once again, the Potomac River, uh, those, the park manages 
Great Falls Park on the north end of the parkway. And then uh, the bottom right, Clara Barton National Historic Site, uh, which is located uh, on the Maryland side of the George Washington Memorial Parkway, uh, right next to Glen Echo Park, right here in the top right corner. Oops, sorry. So uh, we were considering what projects of those we wanted to present to the Investment Review Board. And, and the Investment Review Board was the body of subject matter experts that parks presented their projects to and competed internally so that we could um, you know, get, get LRF funding for our projects to move them forward. And um, this IRB was a requirement for the GOA project. So this, was, this group was established just so that we were um, successful in making kind of long-term smart decisions on how to obligate our LRF funding within the park or within the National Park Service. And so remember those three criteria, is your project ready to start? So uh, within the George Washington Memorial Parkway, we had had a number of discussions, um, planning sessions, work sessions, about what we were going to do with Clara Barton National Historic Site. Um, in 2019, we had a visioning charrette. It kind of was an opportunity for park staff and other subject matter experts to think about the long-term management of the place and what kind of um, experience we wanted to provide there. Uh, visitor services, the interp and ed folks, uh, coming off of that visioning charrette created a programmatic document I'm talking about the type of specific visitor services that they could provide in type of uh, interpretive planning, school groups, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, then you, we had also a, a facilitated internal discussion about the future of the site. So we brought in a facilitator who helped us kind of navigate uh, each individual division's perspective, point of view um, about how we could be successful in being stewards of Clara Barton National Source Site, but also providing some type of visitor experience. And then in 2020, um, we were lucky enough to have a project scoping assessment. And this was a external group of subject matter experts that came together to look at the facility in a holistic way in group projects um, that created a complete picture of what was needed uh, for the rehabilitation and desired visitor experience at Clara Barton National Historic Site. And then in July of 2021, we created what is known as the blocking diagram. And we'll go into that blocking diagram in a few more slides. So, are we shovel ready? Um, we were shovel ready because of the work that the park had done long before uh, GOA was a thing. One of the other criteria was leveraging. And what was leveraging? Uh, it was simply ensuring that um, we weren't putting good money after bad. Would this investment in the facility allow parks to um, be good stewards of these resources in the future? Would this allow for uh, this investment to be capitalized by other partners, nonprofit partners, um, local government agencies, so that this investment uh, would, would last, right? It's been the history of the Park Service, I know it, a part that I worked or a project that I worked on is that we get an influx of money, say a donation, and that donation allows us to rehabilitate a site. And we go in, we rehabilitate it, it's beautiful, and then we don't touch it for a number of years, right? We wait for the next influx of cash, whether that's another donation or that's some project funds. Well, the whole idea of leveraging is that 
Um, we don't do that, right? We use this investment into the facility uh, so that it can continue to be a viable facility for the foreseeable future. And so when we did our presentation to the IRB, they said, yeah, we'll, down here, they said, yeah, we think this is an important project, but we only wanted to uh, address the deferred maintenance in the in exterior building envelope. They didn't want to do anything into the interior unless we, the park, uh, sought out opportunities for leveraging opportunities. And so uh, what we did within GWMP is we explored kind of concurrent leveraging paths, an existing cooperative agreement with Montgomery County, or something known as an RFEI, Request for Expressions of Interest. Adjacent to Clara Bart National Historic Site, which is located right here, is Glen Echo Park. In 2018, we entered into a cooperative agreement with Montgomery County, which assigns day-to-day -day operation to the county. That cooperative agreement also allows the county to sub-assign Glen Echo Park daily operations, excuse me, to a nonprofit partner uh, called Glen Echo Park Partnership for Arts and Culture, or GEPPAC. And so um, this was one of the potential leveraging opportunities to determine whether or not the nonprofit partner in Montgomery County wanted to expand this assigned space to include Clara Barton National Historic Site that sits right there. Historically, Glen Echo Park was an amusement park. We still have the carousel. And here's a picture taken of Clara Barton National Historic Site with the, the roller coaster track going right in front of her front door. The other path we took to pursue a leveraging opportunity was uh, RFEI or Request for Expression of Interest. And I was having a hallway conversation with one of my colleagues at the park one day, and they uh, described the RFEI as a public brainstorming session. And I think that's an accurate uh, description of what an RFEI is. So it's a public brainstorming session about future uses, adaptive reuse, of a facility. And so this uh, RFEI had been used at other parks and we wanted to pursue an RFEI for Clara Barton National Historic Site. What's important about this is that uh, we would only consider adaptive reuse that were compatible with the, the, the history um, and the use and the desired outcome of the site. So internally we joked about, well, what if RF, uh, what if Gold's Gym submits an RFEI? Well, you know, you don't want um, weights clunking around in a 200 year old home. It's probably incompatible with the vision that we have for Clara Barton National Historic Site. So therefore they wouldn't, wouldn't be considered. This is an image of the blocking diagram. So as we were engaging with the RFEI and uh, having conversations with Montgomery County and a nonprofit partner. Um, we went back to those shovel ready documents to understand uh, what visitor services we wanted to provide and what spaces were critically important to providing that desired visitor experience. And so we identified spaces marked here in purple that were available for partner use and spaces that we wanted to retain. So some of the most critical spaces uh, this was the first um, headquarters of the American Red Cross. Claire Barton, I'm sorry, founded the American Red Cross. And so she ran the organization out of this building for a number of years, um, out of the back office. She also greeted visitors uh, in this front office, or excuse me, this front sitting room. This is the first floor of the facility. And so we wanted to retain those spaces uh, for the desired visitor experience. On the second floor, uh, Clara Barton's bedroom, where she dies in 1912, 1812, sorry about that. No, 
1912. And, um, and she had a, an attached sitting room. So we wanted to maintain those two spaces. And then these were bedrooms for uh, volunteers and they've essentially been adaptively reused. This was outfitted as a, a library and a conference room for a number of years. And most recently this space here served as um, NPS staff space. I'm gonna go back a slide to the first floor. Um, this partner space, uh, the 300 square foot partner space was a visitor orientation space. So this has been adaptively reused and this was used for the Eastern National Outlet. The difference between the yellow spaces and the purple spaces was that the yellow space is obviously important to the visitor experience, but also retain a lot of the historic fabric. A lot of the purple spaces, uh, historic fabric has been lost. And then this is the third floor, uh, two spaces on the third floor, one for partner, one for landlord. Uh, there's some uh, original Red Cross stained glass here that um, makes this a very significant space. And then in the basement, uh, we use uh, this large space for uh, collection storage and potential offices. So uh, we pursued both the cooperative agreement with Montgomery County and the RFEI. Uh, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, so cooperative agreement, like I said, assigned space to Montgomery County and GPAC or Glen Echo Park Partnership Board. At Glen Echo Park, we wanted to determine if they were willing to expand that assigned space to include Clara Bart National Historic Site. And they said that they, they would like to take that on. And so um, we had internal conversations with subject matter experts within the Park Service. They said we could amend the cooperative agreement to do that. And so we're, we can move forward with the conversations with Montgomery County. At the same time, we issued the RFEI. We said, public, what are your brainstorm ideas for adaptive reuse of the site? Um, we published the RFEI for 45 days and we got, um, we have also hosted two open houses. Uh, we received 16 comments, uh, 16 brainstormed ideas from the RFEI, of which only three met the requirements for submissions within the RFEI. Two of those were from companies that wanted to run vending machines out of Clara Barton National Historic Site. So I was responsible for evaluating all those brainstormed ideas and um, making recommendations to the park superintendent. And so just following the RFEI track, I made the recommendation to the, R, uh, to the superintendent that we did not move forward with the RFP, a request for proposal, which would have been the next step in the RFEI using a, con a concession authority to allow for third party operation of those partner assigned spaces. And then um, we're pursuing the cooperative agreement. So work with the partner uh, to inform design. The partner is kind of generally representing the interest of a third party who would like to adaptively reuse those spaces. And then we'll have to uh, amend or update the cooperative agreement to include Clara Barton as the assigned space um, for the for the operation of those adaptively reused spaces. So at this time, we're not pursuing um, the RFEI or any concessions authority. We're really doing this through uh, the cooperative agreement and the partnership model to identify a leveraging partner for Clara Barton National Source Site, who will help uh, run operations out of those um, partner assigned spaces. So I'll pause there, or actually I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> All right, no, thank you. Um, we might stop just for a moment here um, and look in the chat and see if there are any questions for either 
Aaron uh, or Chris. Um, I don't know if there are any quite yet, um, but I'm going to ask Paloma. She is the uh, yeah. I, the monitor I don't of that. I don't see um, any questions. Julie, do you want to allow some time, or should we? Hold off any questions to the end. Um, I, I do have questions, uh, but okay. I, I, I think we will uh, hold off after Stephen because right. maybe Stephen's presentation will actually uh, either answer what I have or cause me to um, uh, have even more questions. So why don't we go ahead with uh, Stephen and then we'll do a wrap up of Q&A at the end. And while I'm giving your introduction, Stephen, maybe, um, you could take over the screen. And Stephen Pisani is the branch chief of historic architecture and strategic planning at the Historic Architecture, Conservation and Engineering Center, HACE, in the Northeast, Region 1. Prior to this position, he served as the Washington Support Office Bureau Historical Architect and Program Manager for the Cultural Resources Directorate Park Historic Structures. Stephen has a 30 years of MPS experience in the historic preservation field at park, regional and Washington office level positions. So um, Stephen, can you take it away? Sure. <clears throat> can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Oh, okay. Something's happening. This looks good. Can you see the whole screen or the just the? Um... Uh, it it the, you just did something and now I don't think it's quite as good. So whatever oh, you okay. just did. Um, Hang on. Sure. Sorry, I apologize. Perfect. Got it. All right. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and and talk about my group today and our efforts. Um, and our involvement in the Legacy Restoration Fund and the Great Americans Outdoor Act. As Julie said, I work for the Historic Architecture, Conservation and Engineering Center. And we're a group based out of Lowell, Massachusetts, but we're regional based for region one. So we're currently composed of three branches. We have a design and preservation branch, we have a construction, conservation, and training branch, and also a historic architecture and strategic planning branch. Uh, the three branches are all composed of a cadre of preservation professionals, uh, highly skilled preservation tradespeople, as well as um, project specialists and with specialty experience in materials conservation. Our group supports over 80 parks in the Northeast region. And we cover all aspects of preservation work for research to planning to design and construction. We also provide um, support and guidance for the National Park Service Accessibility Program and Dam Safety Program in the Northeast region. One of our big contributions to this effort are, as Chris uh, laid out in his presentation, was the maintenance action teams, which in the Northeast is we're trying to coin as the maintenance assistance teams. For region one, sorry, um, our, the operational premise that we're running with for um, the Northeast region is the understanding that parks were underfunded. We don't have enough staff and um, money to actually maintain and keep all of our uh, heritage assets in good condition. This lack of preservation maintenance leads to uh, a loss of historic fabric, which then leads to loss of historic integrity and also reduces or greatly increases the risk of damage to um, cultural landscapes and historic furnished interiors. For this effort, we're focusing on uh, supporting parks and accomplishing critical preservation maintenance.
This includes repair, rehab, stabilization, and preservation projects. Uh, we're doing it predominantly with in-house employees and um, employing positions across multiple trades. We're trying to accomplish high priority deferred maintenance and reducing the backlog and keeping primary resources in, in acceptable or good condition. And by doing this, we're trying to achieve uh, cost efficiencies and strength capacity of our NPS workforce. So uh, for region one, there's going to be three uh, haste mat teams. We'll have one in Boston, another one in New Jersey, and in FY 23 through 24, there'll be a third in Virginia. For the Northeast region for FY 21, 22, there's 32 projects to be accomplished. Uh, 19 of those are going to be completed by HACE. An additional 13 will be completed by the Historic Preservation Training Center, which is a similar group based in Maryland who has established uh, a more service-wide effort. So for 21 and 22, they'll be assisting with a large number of projects within the North, Northeast region. Uh, we're partnering with the Student Conservation Association, as well as regional career technical education and vocational sc high schools uh, to provide opportunities to the next generation. As Chris said, the uh, Mather High School in New York is, is one of our big partners. Uh, here's a list of our FY21-22 projects, and I apologize. Um, I did my best to avoid uh, acronyms and alpha codes, but um, this one slipped. So what we're looking here is approximately 19 product projects. We have projects at uh, Adams National Historic Site in Massachusetts, Blackstone River Valley in uh, Rhode Island, Edison National Historic uh, Park in New Jersey, Fire Island, uh, Fort Stanwix, Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, property in Massachusetts, Governor's Island in New York, Governor's Island again, uh, Hamilton Grange in New York City, Longfellow House in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Marsh Billings in uh, New Hampshire, Morristown, uh, Saugus Ironworks in Massachusetts, Salem Maritime in Massachusetts, uh, Saratoga, upstate New York, and uh, Weir Farm in Connecticut. So for looking ahead, um, this just goes over how projects will be, um, those projects will be identified for us. But our focus is to be on small and medium sized parks. And uh, within those parks, we'll be focusing on the most historic, uh, most important historic structures and landscapes. We're hoping to balance approximately 50% critical ma preservation maintenance and the other 50% is small scale re rehabilitation projects. And HACE is hoping to continue to focus on the legacy restoration fund, uh, MAT execution for the overall benefit of park units within the Northeast region, uh, both through the FY25 and hopefully beyond. Something that I'm um, involved in is the Simplified Strategic Investment Plans, or SFIP. And these um, investment plans, we're out visiting small to medium-sized uh, parks within the Northeast region. We're out there assessing um, annual and cyclic pre preventative maintenance needs. Uh, we're identifying uh, projects and costs to return those uh, primary resources to good condition. We're also looking at the uh, parks base funding and allocations for their facility management division, their uh, interpretive educational division, administration, uh, administrative division, law enforcement and park management special events. Uh, to see where their, their current funding is going. And 
The reason we're doing that is so that we can verify the preventative maintenance, what we're calling the gap, which is um, the difference between what we should be spending versus what we're actually spending on preservation maintenance. We'll be looking at uh, parks current maintenance staffing levels and what their capacity is uh, to maintain these structures once they're back to a good condition. We're identifying preventative and recurring maintenance tasks to be accomplished by park staff. We're also developing a 10 year cyclic maintenance program. And the, um, that will cover the items that the parks aren't, uh, don't have the capacity to do themselves. So those activities will be trying to complete through small contracts, seasonal employee hires or MAP team support. What this should give us or will give us is a plan to bring parks important historic assets to good condition and keep them in good condition. We should be providing solid data to allow park and regional management to make well-informed decisions on staffing and funding prioritization and have a solid reduction in deferred maintenance, both present and in the future. Uh, these are some photos of our preservation crews working on a uh, preservation project in Salem, Massachusetts. This was a timber frame structure and there was some um, masonry work. And here is some of our um, youth engagement. I believe this was at Edison National Historic Park um, doing some repointing work and some uh, carpentry. And I'll end it there. All right, thank you so much, Stephen, um, for all of that. And uh, I think we have time now for um, um, questions. Yes. Uh, one of the ones, well, Paloma, there might be something. Uh, no, none in the chat, but please oh. feel free to put any questions in the chat or any comments for any of our panelists. Yes. And uh, one of the things I was struck by, uh, Aaron, that you were saying, Maybe it had to do with the specificity of your particular site, but I wonder how applicable it was of, of so many, is that the opportunity to apply for and, and use the, the funds from the um, Legacy Restoration Fund seemed like a, the opportunity to start talking about larger issues, uh, like uh, bringing in partners or, or what is long-term uh, sustainability mean and uh, dealing with these big issues like climate change and not doing things the way perhaps we've done them always in the past, but bigger picture. And I, I wonder if that was the case, uh, as you were saying, that you started the conversation even before this, uh, the Great American Outdoors Act began. And I wonder from what you've been hearing, uh, if this was an opportunity for a lot of parks, a lot of units to uh, start uh, implementing things that they've been discussing and talking about for a long time. I think Chris is likely in a better position to answer that question based on his kind of service wide perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I can say specifically uh, for the George Washington Memorial Parkway is that um, And one of the reasons I highlighted the deferred maintenance number in the, the amount of OMPS or operational funds that would need to go into the assets in the park to maintain those facilities in good standing is that um, these, and Chris said this during his presentation, this is a funding source that is beyond the scale of um, previous funding sources for these types of projects in the park service. And, and I don't wanna get out over my skis a little bit. Chris can probably talk about that in more detail, but you know, we, we have a lot of needs uh, along the parkway. Um, and, and this project is right in that $20 million range. And so, you know, most of the funding sources we have available to us aren't going to be able to meet a $20 million 
rehabilitation project. And so this goal was a great opportunity for us to be able to, um, you know, address the rehabilitation of Claire Barton National Historic Site, which is also a National Historic Landmark. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you, Aaron. I can try to answer that maybe um, a little bit further. Um, as uh, the Park Service was anticipating some, a large funding source coming, but it wasn't called GOA yet, but we had a uh, you know, an, an understanding that maybe something was going to happen. Um, the Park Service started investing in uh, project scoping assessments, uh, which were sending out teams of architects and engineers out to parks where they knew sizable projects existed and they needed to just be scoped and quantified and just described. So that was part of the effort. Then um, as soon as the, um, the GOA Act was uh, kind of you know, passed and this top 75, T75 list of parks with the largest portfolios and the, um, the most deferred maintenance and the highest visitation. Once that was generated, then um, there was a team from Park Planning and Special Studies that contacted all those parks and tried to um, do facility investment plans. They were called GFIPS. So it was a GOA or GOA specific facility investment plan to say, hey, if you, do you have any projects that meet all these criteria? They're high percentage of deferred maintenance, the $20 million. They are, they are more or less ready to go. The compliance is good. You know, you have the capacity to execute them and so on. So a list of those projects was generated uh, very quickly. Also, we were able, we have something called the project management information system where uh, Paul Parks can put in funding requests for projects according to various fund source rules and guidelines. And so we were able to essentially data mine that database and look for projects that also met that criteria. So we were able to come up with those projects. I think, um, you know, then I think the word got out to other parks that, hey, you know, this is happening. And so um, something that was going on simultaneously with Park Service Facility Management at a leadership level was we were transitioning from something called the Development Advisory Board to something called the Investment Review Board, where now instead of uh, just reviewing projects at schematic design that were already baked, all the, already you know way out of the gate, now the Investment Review Board wanted to see projects at investment concept stage, which is a much smarter way to direct traffic. When you know a, a park has an idea, they work with their region and and some you know uh, facility uh, and design specialists to get it thought through and and an inter interdisciplinary team to provide input and then they bring it to the investment review board to see if they can get funding. So that whole like investment concept presentation and review started to happen uh, simultaneously at a very rapid pace. I mean, this stuff was happening kind of every other month. It was really kind of wild. Um, the, and then the this map team concept came into um, kind of being. And so we tried to des describe, all right, what is a map project? What, you know, we kind of know what <laughs> a large major investment looks like. What does kind of one of these smaller scale investment looks like? And, and we said, it's definitely a project that has an accurate scope that's somewhere south of $250,000. Kind of the sweet spot is $125,000 to $175,000 because that allows a team to come into a park, execute a project within a few pay periods, and then move on to the next park. We don't want these teams to get bogged down for like an entire year or entire season at one park. The idea is that these kind of move through the system. We can adjust that uh, in the future, but um, they're primarily able to be accomplished with, with a day labor crew that has a mix of skill sets, maybe journeyman trade skills, all the way down to entry level trade skills and everything in between. So you can have people learning from one another as they're doing the work. So you get kind of on the job training Compliance had to be a streamlined compliance pathway for NEPA and NHPA. Like we can't have complex time consuming compliance actions required for a MAT project. Um, we definitely wanted again to target those small and medium parks uh, and small and medium parks where the park management team and leadership was on board, where a superintendent is on board and facility manager and a cultural resource manager. And everybody is like, yes, let's do this. Let's, let's support this effort. Um, and then that we can provide 
um, kind of experienced first line supervisors to that team that's executing the work. So when they show up at the project site, they have points of contact that are in park management that support it and that they have leadership in their team that can help execute the project. So we kind of, you know, developed the criteria and had a strategy for how to acquire the larger projects. And then we did the same thing at the other scale. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, Julie. But no, thank you. It was uh, very thorough. Um, and of course, it raised even more questions in my mind that I think we have time for. Uh, but I want to ask Paloma, she's been monitoring chat closer than I have, if we have yeah, any other have questions. One, one question. Um, in the MAC process, how are competing projects given priority? Um, well, you know, so that it was that, that kind of criteria that I, um, if, if a project can meet all of those criteria, then I think it's just a matter of uh, working with that regional uh, MAC coordinator and the regional chief of facilities. We are trying, uh, if at all possible, to impact every park unit at the end of FY25, to impact every park unit in some way with the LRF funding. So um, if we can't get to you this summer, if your project is close to being ready, or if it's, um, you know, needs a little bit more uh, preparation in terms of compliance or design or thinking through, maybe we can consider that in the 24 or 25 program. But right now we're really focusing on readiness. You know, FY23 is upon us here in about two months. So I, I think that's the, 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 the criterion with the heaviest weight right now is what is ready to execute and meets all those other criteria. And then moving forward, we can take on, um, we can work with parks and regions to develop um, that projects for FY24 and 25. Great, thank you. Readiness is key. It is. So many areas, yes. Thanks, thank you. Um, Julie, that's that's it uh, right. in terms of questions. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, um, sort of going back to my original uh, initial comments, uh, talking about our, our interns. And as I was reviewing our entire list of uh, interns for the summer, all 100 plus of you uh, in NCPE's program, um, I, I could kind of break them out into the, uh, uh, the museum folks, the uh, cultural resources folks, um, archaeology, anthropology, and then also uh, what I would call design, uh, architecture. We, we've got some with habs and hairs, uh, and, and sort of landscape folks there too, with a, a small number of, of communications people and a very smaller number of the hands-on conservation. And so listening to all of you speak today, you know, Chris, Aaron, and Stephen, sounds like a lot of work needs to be done by people who know how to work with their hands. Uh, really, this is where the work happens, the actual work happens. Um, of course, there's a great deal of the planning that needs to go into it even before the work begins. But as I'm struck in uh, our little part of the world here in Ithaca, New York, uh, people in the trades are, are increasingly small group of people and they're older and older. And uh, so I'm just putting out a, a comment there for anybody who also, uh, especially among our, our attendees and in the internship programs, uh, working with your hands is a, 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 um, an ability uh, and a, it sounds like a service that uh, will, uh, is extremely necessary especially to do this kind of work that is so necessary for our parks, because we've talked for a long time about how overdue all of this work is. Um, that really wasn't a question, it was more of a comment. Mm -hmm. That's a, a good plug for trades, for the trades, Julie. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And for the traditional trades uh, and for the non-traditional trades, certainly for preservation skills, and for just electric electricians, plumbers, carpenters, you know, excavators, heavy equipment, all of these people, it, these can be very rewarding and very lucrative uh, and challenging careers. Uh, I would encourage people, I totally agree. Great. I, I think with that, um, we are 
of course, I keep on forgetting to introduce myself, Julie Johnson speaking again. Uh, on the screen is the contact information for today's panelists. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully they don't mind being contacted. If anybody uh, uh, participating wants to uh, get in touch and talk further about the work that they're doing. Um, I just wanna wrap up by saying thank you to our panelists and sharing your uh, experiences and expertise with us. Um, again, more, more information than we can probably um, uh, understand and, and devour today um, in a short period of time. Thank you for being succinct. Uh, and thank you so much, Paloma, for making this all possible. Um, and to our attendees, I uh, really appreciate your participation this summer. Yes, I, I echo Julie's thank you. And to our attendees, if you have any um, opinions and thoughts about future um, programs, future webinars, what would you want to see? Um, what has helped you understand the Park Service this summer? Um, we love suggestions, so please feel free to reach out to us, um, email or, or call. And thank you for attending. Thanks to our attendees. Um, and this is the last of our Nick P webinar series for the summer. So thank you, Julie. You're very welcome. Thank you and so long. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.